So we are reading about the king, King Asvapati, who will become the human father of Savitri, the one through whom the world's desire, the burning need of the earth gets expressed so that the Supreme Divine Mother incarnates in a human form. That doesn't happen for a long time yet in the book. We are reading about this remarkable individual. But in these lines which we were just reading at the end last week, Sri Aurobindo was telling us that in all of us, hid deep in man, celestial powers can dwell, heavenly powers. This fragile ship of our body, which is so breakable and perishable, is carrying through the sea of years, the ocean of time, an incognito of the imperishable. The imperishable, the permanent, the eternal and infinite, the one, is disguised within each one of us, a spirit that is a flame of God abides, immortal in our mortal poverty. And that spirit is an artist, an artist of his own beauty and delight. And in the next line, Sri Aurobindo calls him a sculptor. This artist is shaping the forms of the infinite. All these material forms are first uh, sketches of those eventual forms which the infinite will inhabit. And this spirit is the screened, unrecognized inhabitant living within us all. And he hides in a small, dumb seed, his cosmic thought. He has a, a conception, uh, an idea of what will be, you know, and he expresses it in seed form. And the fact that that seed is within us determines our shapes and the acts that we do. That seed is a passenger from one lifetime to another, from one form to another, from one scale to another, from the smallest single-celled creatures to the most complex forms. He changes his imaged self from form to form. And that seed is conscious, he's watching uh, the work that he's doing he regards this icon, this representation of divinity growing because he looks at it, it grows and develops and changes. And in its very simple form, in the form of a worm or any other humble creature, he can foresee the divine form and the divine being that it's going to develop into. I think that's where we stopped. No? In the worm foresees the coming God. We'll start on this side. Patty, will you read? From line 61. Yes. At last the traveler in the paths of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity in the transient symbol of humanity's grace. He feels his substance of undying self and loses his kinship to mortality, a beam of the eternal smites his heart. His thought stretches into infinity. All in him turns to spirit vastnesses. His soul breaks out to join the oversoul. His life is oceaned by that super life. He has drunk from the breast of the mother of the world. A topless supernature fills his frame. She adopts his spirit's everlasting ground as the security of her changing world and shapes the figure of her unborn might. Immortally, she conceives herself in him. In the creature, the unveiled creatrix works. Her face
face is seen through his face, her eyes through his eyes, her being is his through a vast identity. Thank you. Anybody would like to ask anything or share anything? Can't hear you, Bob. Yes. You'd like to have that explained, yes. So this happens when this traveler, this incognito of the imperishable, when he reaches the frontiers of eternity, passes through all the levels of development. He's still draped and covered by this uh, transient, impermanent, temporary symbol of humanity, but he feels, he experiences his substance of undying self, of immortality. It's a very crucial moment in our development when we become aware that we are not dependent on this body for our existence, that we have and are an undying self. Is this referring to the psychic being? It's not necessarily the psychic being. That's one way in which we can experience it. Mm. Another way is when we uh, have this experience of our oneness with the universe. Mm. This word oversoul is kind of surprising to me. It's rarely used by Shrivenism. We've heard the air of overmind, but oversoul means exactly I think Sheobindo is using it here. I don't know whether you remember still in Book 7 when Savitri finds and unites with her individual soul, then she becomes aware of her oversoul, of the central being, of which her individual soul is like a projection. It's a very beautiful description of how that vast oversoul uh, sees all the world and she knows how difficult it is to be an individual human being. So she puts a small portion of herself. In the, in the Upanishads it says it's no bigger than the thumb of a man. She seats that in the human heart and it's that presence in us which helps us to face all the difficulties and challenges of life. And what happens with Savitri in that section in uh, Book 7, Canto 5, um, the over-soul and the individual soul, they recognize each other and they rush into each other and they are one. So I think that is what is being described here. I don't remember. I'll have a look when I get home. I can check it on the computer. It's not in my uh, individual database in my brain. So then when that moment comes, when he feels his substance of undying self, his immortal being, then he loses his kinship to mortality. He's no longer bound by this... Uh, human nature which is subject to death. A ray, a beam of the eternal strikes his heart and his thought expands, stretches into infinitude and everything in him then is transformed into spirit vastnesses. All the limitations are dissolved. The individual soul breaks out of this form and joins the oversoul. And the life is oceaned by that super life. That might be another word that he doesn't use very often in the poem. But that life which is beyond uh, the ordinary evolutionary life that our bodies are bound by. His life is ocean. An ocean is, seems something vast and limitless. No? He's 
been brought to this point by the mother of the worlds. She has nourished him. We can say the supreme conscious force of the divine who is missioned to give birth to all these phenomena in the universe. So his frame, the framework of his individuality, body, life, mind, is filled up by a topless supernature, not this ordinary evolutionary nature, much, much higher divine nature fills him up, this, which it has no upper limit, it's topless. Can we comprehend that nature? No, I think Sri Aurobindo is helping us to uh, know that it exists and evoking it in a way that helps us to imagine something, but until we have this experience, uh, then we won't know it. But when we have this experience, when we feel our substance of undying self, then uh, we, won't, we will not know it because we've read it in a book. We'll know it directly by experience. You know? And when that happens, this creative conscious force adopts his spirit, the spirit of this individual being, as a basis, as the security, the, the safe foundation of her changing world. Everything is changing and developing in the universe. No? She takes this individual being and his spirit as a foundation. And on that foundation, she shapes the figure, representations of her unborn mites, the powers and principles that haven't yet been manifested or haven't so far been manifested, the powers and principles of the future. Immortally, she conceives herself, her own being and power in him, and she works that creative power, that creatrix works through this individual creature that she has shaped and prepared. Then we can see her face through his face, through the face of that individual. And her eyes look through his eyes. She identifies with him. What's the matter, Anandi? Her eyes, her being is his through a vast identity. They are one, united. She can work through this human representative. The, the image in, her, in line 71, hmm. he has drawn from the breasts of the mother of the worlds. And um, really, most human beings on earth have drawn from the breasts of the mother. Yes. So it's like a, it, it's a That's what has been. That is what has been happening to him and what's happening to us. We're being nourished by the forces of the universe and we are growing and growing and growing. And then at that moment we will realize how we've been nourished and who it is that's been nourishing us. Well, on a sort of a, I don't know, <laughs> grammatical level, so we're looking at the capitalization and the non-capitalization of the feminine through this whole section? Yeah, that's a bit difficult because whenever it comes at the beginning of a line, it's automatically ca uh, uh. capitalized. And I've mentioned it before. I mean, we can notice this capitalization, but we shouldn't make too much of it, especially in the later part of the book, which Sri Aurobindo uh, was not able to revise uh, with his eyes, only through his yeah. ears. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Mila. Yes, so the mother of the worlds, she has a changing world. No, it is developing. Yes, I think it is not that. 
this uh, supernature comes into him and now she uses that everlasting spirit which he's carrying within him as the basis and the security of her changing world that is here in our world where evolution is going on. It's a connection no? between the eternal, the everlasting world and this world and it's made through the individual. This, this is one of the great truths that Sri Aurobindo would like us to begin to really know, you know that the individual can become a link and a representative of the universal and of the eternal. So when this link is made, then that individual becomes an agent of change in the world. I think that is what it is saying. She's working through him for change. <laughs> no, it's, uh, she doesn't need him for security, <laughs> but um, in her action in the world, she chooses this being as the basis for her work. Hmm? Yeah? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite grasp the beginning of what you said, Nanan. Is he referring to Ashwapati also at this level of development? Yes. Yes. H here he's saying, making it as a general statement about the possibility, but we will see how this process is described in him as a character in the poem, as an individual. He mentions it here uh, to prepare us for what King Aswapati is going to be. Uh, we'll read on, no? This will bomb next, yeah? Penumbra. Penumbra shot with the flame. A very clear is the heart known, ever meet, or search for something or someone never found, cause of an idea never made real here, an endless spiral of ascent and fall, until at last it reaches the giant form. Through which his glory shines for whom we were made, and we break into the infinite of God. Across our nature's border line we escape into its supernatural arc of living life. Thank you. Penumbra means twilight, half light. Mother mentioned it in she uses this term in connection with the chamber in Matrimandia that she wanted it to be a penumbra lit by that ray. Yeah, of course it's shadowy, it's a mixture of light and dark. O ombra is, has to do with a, with a shadow, yeah, ombre. Yeah. So what is Shobindo is revealing in this um, first sentence, he says, or second sentence, a static oneness and dynamic power descend in him the integral Godhead's seals. I believe this refers to the, the third realization which is the culmination of Sri Aurobindo's yoga. You can find the psychic being and experience the psychic transformation. We can widen and experience the spiritual realization. But the highest state is when this descent happens, this double descent of a static 
permanent, unchanging oneness linked with a dynamic power of action in the world. This is the characteristic of the, we can say, the supramental realization. And then the soul and the body, there's a transformation of the body. Take that splendid stamp of the oneness and the dynamic power then in man, in a human being, is revealed the overt divine, not the divine hidden and working from within and giving some glimpses of his presence, but his absolutely open, clear, evident presence. And then he ta starts to tell us that our lives are a long, dim preparation for reaching that point. Here we are circling round and round. We're climbing gradually upwards to a peak which has never been trodden by any human feet. And we are always seeking in this twilight state where sudden flashes of flame of energy and insight may come. But what we are looking for is this reality that's veiled from us, but which we half know and which we are always missing and longing for. We don't even know what it is that we are searching for. A search for something or someone never found. And what we're doing is we are worshipping an ideal that has never yet been realized here and we are following this endless spiral sometimes we go up but then just as on when you're climbing a mountain you get to a certain high point but before you can go higher you have to go right down and up again this spiraling circle of ascent and fall until at last is reached that giant point that indefinable and yet immense point through which his glory shines for whom we were made and we break into the infinity of God. It's a complete change of our consciousness and our life. And every time I read this line, I remember my dear teacher, Amal Kiran, who used to quote uh, the old Christian state, Saint Augustine, one of the most interesting of Christian state saints. And uh, he said, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts cannot rest until they rest in thee, in you. So. Sorry? Saint Augustine from North Africa. <laughs> Sorry, English pronunciation. He was, he spoke Latin, he wrote Latin, Augustinus. So then, when we break into the infinity of God, we, we escape from all these borderlines that confine us now. We escape into that arc. An arc is not the whole of a circle, no, it's just a, a, a part of the circumference. That living light of supernature, the higher divine nature. Lela, would you read? This now was witnessed in that son of ours. In him, the fight and vision lay his place. <coughs> Original and eternal remains of which all nature forces into art. The cosmic world set his secret hand to turn daily mad energy to fire. Present love, 
So this whole process which Robindo has been describing to us from line 43, um, 42 onwards, this whole process now could be seen in Asvapati and Sri Aurobindo refers to him as a son of force. He's a child of the mother of the great creative conscious force. So in him, that high transition from the human state to supernature, now it has a foundation in him. It's as if he's been chosen by this artist, this artist of beauty and delight, this original and supernal immanence, the divine consciousness and force that's dwelling within the universe. The whole process of nature is the art of that one, that original supernal immanence, this cosmic worker. And it's that cosmic worker has now decided to start working on uh, human body, the frail mud engine of Asvapati, to make it serve a heavenly purpose. So at first what happens is the inner presence is working behind the screen. Maybe Asvapati is not uh, aware of it. People don't notice it. No. It's um, this disguise that uh, is worn, but that presence is working there, hammering away to beat his soil, his matter, so that it's able to bear that huge weight of a titan force, a titan consciousness. Already in Asvapati, there are some rough, half-hewn blocks of natural strength and those get refined to build his soul into the form of a statued god, a wonderful marble, firm, glowing, powerful figure, that craftsman of the magic stuff of self, the consciousness, the force of being, that craftsman who labors at his high and difficult plan in the wide workshop of the wonderful world. The whole world is his studio, his workshop, where he's working out his wonderful, um, all these forms that will uh, fulfill his plan, his high and difficult plan that he's had in mind from the very beginning no? and is gradually working out. So a certain moment comes when there's this sudden, abrupt, transcendent miracle, this breaking into the infinity of God. No? That craftsman, that inner artist, the masked, immaculate grandeur is able to make an outline at last of his dreamed magnificence of things to be. There he is working away in life, in the womb of life. He's going to give birth to uh, the next species, the next higher possibility, his dreamed magnificence of things to be. Travail, of course, is connected with the French word travailler, 
but it, in English we specially use it, I don't know how it is in French, uh, for, uh, for labor, for the labor of the mother giving birth. So um, there's this whole process of inward form formation and then giving birth. So there's a marriage. There's a marriage between earth and heaven. And a mysterious, mirac miraculous marriage between earth and heaven which connects the divine on the higher levels of consciousness with the mortal scheme, the earthly scheme where death is dominant. And as a result, a seer is born, a great rishi, a shining guest of time. He's not compelled to be in this world of space and time. He agrees to be here as a guest. Aswapati is a seer. Bessie, you like to read? 920. Nations. All the great inhibitions were torn off and broken. The intellect cast a lusty seal. Truly, unpassioned, found immense sky wings. An imperial vision saw and knew. The boundless mind became a boundless land. The sin itself made it. Thank you. So this describes the birth of a seer, of a great rishi, one who has the knowledge. For him, mind's limiting firmament ceased above. This word firmament uh, reminds me of the opening passage of the Old Testament where it describes a vast, undefined state in which uh, the Lord separated the upper firmament from the lower firmament. So a firmament, something firm and strong, a kind of limit. Mm? So mind is like that. Mind for us, even higher mind, it's like a, an upper limit. And in the Upanishads, it's described as a lid. I think Sri Aurobindo refers to it as the hard and lustrous lid. It is uh, seen as a, as a golden lid above the mind. Through that, uh, higher knowledge can trickle down to us, but eventually it has to be broken. So for him, for... As for party, that limiting firmament is removed. And then there's this mysterious line, in the griffin forefront of the night and day. You've looked up griffin? Yes, I have. What does it say? Yeah, in Greek mythology, a fabulous beast with the wings and head of an eagle and the body of a lion. It is thought by the Greeks protect the gold of the Scythians, and by transference, the meaning of the word can also be construed to be a grimly earnest guardian. Mm, a grimly earnest guardian. Mm, yes. So again, my teacher Amal Kiran 
who had a lot of correspondence with Sherbindo about the poem, and especially this first part, told me that he always regretted not having asked Sherbindo about this line. He asked him about many lines, but not this one. And then now he, he told me, how could I have missed that? Why didn't I ask? So Nolini has given an explanation of the significance of the griffin here, that it's a, a, a beast which has mastery on the earth like a lion and in the heavens like an eagle. So that helps us a bit. I myself, uh, yes, Tuan, please. Griffin in Greek and Roman theaters. A what? Is in Greek and Roman theater, the theater. In the theater, yeah. Not an empty theater. No, no, theater, theater yeah. Griffins are used at the end of the row is distinguished one seats and the other, the night and day. And the night and day. It's a separation wall. Mm. The end to support that wall. That's very, very interesting, Tuan. Thank you. So you mean between better seats and yeah, lesser seats, the, the division? The base case is between the area where the priests were seated and mm. the, the other. The, yes. Thank you. I I've, I've did some research and I found out that the griffin... Uh, the griffins, in fact, draw the chariot yes. of the goddess Nemesis, I think, or Ananke, no? Um, fate, we can say. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, somehow this griffin came into uh, Christian mythology in the Renaissance, and there's a very, very interesting drawing of Botticelli to Dante's Divine Comedy, where the griffins are seen drawing the chariot of Christ. The Lord is moving forward in his chariot and they are conveying him, drawing him. So I don't know really how we can understand all this, but if I couple it with this uh, forefront of the night and day, it's as if where the griffin goes, that's the, the limit, no? the, 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 the leading point of the advance. Mm -hmm. Whether it is fate or whether it is Christ who's in the chariot, uh, where the griffin goes, that's the, the forefront. And this is the forefront, it's the borderline of the world of duality, of the world of night and day. And now it is as if in that borderline there's a gap opened up by the, the birth of Asvapati. There's an opening in this frontier. We could say the frontier of evolution, if we like. Something like that. And it's caused by this union of earth and heaven. So there's a gap opened up in that all-concealing vault, that lid or roof. So there's no more limitations to the conscious ends of being. They just go rolling back like uh, scenery in a theater. Everything opens up. And particularly for him in his experience, the landmarks, the boundary posts of the little person, they just all fall down. No, there aren't any more boundary posts. So this island ego, this little isolated uh, ego-centered being joins its continent. An island is often uh, connected underwater with a continent. No? And if the water level drops for any reason, um, the island isn't an island anymore. It's part of the continent. That vast, solid mass to which it belongs. So this whole world that we live in, this world of rigid, limiting forms, is surpassed. He goes 
in his consciousness, he goes beyond that. The barriers, the borderlines of life open up into the unknown. Uh-huh. Yes. I think this is uh, the result of a supramental realization. At least no night in the consciousness. <coughs> maintaining an individuality that even though the ego I and mean, the ego is seen as something I mean it isn't even described a lot but just that concept of um, it's a center of individual consciousness yeah. Yeah. so that joins its continent it, that center is still there yeah. but it's connected to the past yeah. that's how I understand it yeah. we see the different steps with uh, Aswapati's ego described in this uh, Uh, next cantos. So life's barriers, they just open into the unknown. And the way of thinking, conceptions, covenants, covenants are kind of uh, agreements, aren't they? Hmm? The way that uh, we all habitually think. They're just abolished. And another thing that's abolished, which is annulled, is the soul's treaty with nature's nescience. When the soul accepts the invitation of the Lord to embody in the world of time and space and individualization, it agrees. It's as if it assigns an agreement. This is mentioned in the life divine, that uh, this couldn't happen unless the soul agreed, has been consulted, and has agreed. So the soul has agreed, entered into an agreement to accept um, the nescience of nature, of the state of the unknowing, separating from its original perfect consciousness, accepting the evolutionary limitations. It agrees to be subject to the laws of evolutionary nature, of material nature. But when this moment comes, when this giant point is reached and the seer is born, then that treaty of the soul with nature's nescience is annulled. Soul doesn't have to accept subjection to the laws of nature anymore. It becomes the ruler and the master and it can change those laws if it wants to. So all the gray inhibitions, (laughs) all the things that prevent us, prevent the soul perhaps from being its full self, they're just torn off like cobwebs, no gray inhibitions. At the moment there's a kind of uh, insect which makes a very, very sticky, um, comprehensive web around uh, certain parts of a plant. Now, it looks dreadful. I, I, we asked Murugan, you know, this whole tree is covered in this stuff. Uh, can't we take it off? He said, Mom, I come from an agricultural background, and I am used to this creature, and these webs will disappear by themselves. <laughs> so they did. No? So we didn't have to tear them off in time. They just uh, drop away by themselves, although they're so sticky you can't imagine them doing that. But they do. So but the so gray inhibitions are like that. Must um, their function to be sticky? Yes, to protect whatever's inside. Yes. Catch mm-hmm. <laughs> and that lid, you know, that limiting firmament, is just broken, this hard and lustrous lid. So when that lid is broken, then truth. In our world, truth has to be partitioned. It has to be 
cut up and split into small digestible bits. But when that lid is gone, then truth unpartitioned, like a vast sky, is seen. And it is seen with an Empyrean vision, a vision like that of the sky itself. The Empyrean, it is the blue sky. The bounded mind becomes a boundless light. No shadows, no night. The finite self, the little limited self, mated with infinity. It isn't lost, it's a marriage. Who's next? Larry. His arch now soared into an eagle's flight. Out of the nest, a friendly ship to ignorance. Wisdom upraised him to her master path and made him an arch mason of the soul, a builder of the immortal secret house, an aspirant to supernal kindness, freedom and call to him from on high, above mountains, twilight, and life's star dead night, the dream, the dawn of a spiritual day. Mm, thank you. If we read this line, his march now soared into an eagle's flight, we can imagine him as the griffin. He's been marching, pacing as a lion, and now he takes off and flies very high like a, a great eagle. So through all this process, Aswabhati has been serving his apprenticeship, an apprentice I don't know how it is these days, but uh, they used not to be quite free. They were bound to a master for a certain period of time, no? as a student to learn. So the soul is like that. For a time, it is living as an apprentice to the state of ignorance. No? But when this transformation comes, he's not an apprentice anymore. He, wisdom accepts him, lifts him up uh, to her master craft. He becomes a master craftsman of wisdom. And uh, of course these terms used to be used particularly of uh, the, the masons who, who built the great cathedrals. They were apprentices and then they were journeymen and then they became masters and master architects also. So. He now has been raised up to be an arch mason, not just a head mason, but really an excellent, uh, one of the great designers of the cathedrals. A builder of the secret house of the immortal. He himself will become that house containing the immortal. He's an aspirant to supernal timelessness the state of transcendence. So he's given a prospect of freedom and empire. These are the goals which are set before him. They call to him from on high. According to me, these are two of the main goals of yoga. Freedom, moksha, self-realization, and empire, the capacity to control, to rule, to rule nature, to rule one's life and destiny. So these are the goals set before him. Above mind's twilight, that penumbra of the mental state and the state of life that we know, it's a kind of night. It is lit up by some stars some guiding truths, no? But above that night and that twilight, he sees the beginning, the gleam of a dawn of a spiritual day, a much brighter future. Jordan? Yes? Could you uh, comment on the difference between this candle 
It's already quite high. Yeah. Now, as often happens, I'm noticing that this happens again and again in the poem, very often the first section of a canto, and this is the first section of a canto that's going to take us a long way, Sri Aurobindo summarizes the whole process. So I think here in this first section, he's summarizing the whole of book one, mm. at least up to the beginning of canto five. And he's summarizing um, where Aswapati starts from, who he is, what he is inwardly, and his achievement. We will see this achievement. We could say this is a summary of the whole canto. Because now what comes next uh, is a description of the process of how he grows into this larger self. And yes, this, this canto is the yoga of the soul's release. We see what that first um, goal, freedom, what that brings. And then there's this intermediary, um, canto four, it's called the secret knowledge. It's as if that summarizes for us, initiates us into the knowledge that... Uh, King Aswapati has gained through his soul's release. And then we have the next step. What becomes possible to him now that his soul is released, he's gained this knowledge. What is the next step for him? This is the, the yoga of the spirit's freedom and greatness uh, which, in which there's shown a new aspiration, a new hope, not just the dawn of a spiritual day, something much more, and that uh, he's gifted the power to enter into the, the subtle worlds and see all the planes of existence. Sri Aurobindo says he makes that journey as a representative of the human race. That's in the whole of uh, book two and book three, his whole yoga. We, we continue reading. Uh, we stop here. Yes. I think we'll stop here for today. Hmm? Yeah. We'll, next week we will uh, read the long next section. To there are four more sections to the end of the con. Uh, oh no, timelessness. It means not just a universal knowledge, but going beyond, beyond the creation to the supreme state of timelessness, infinity, uh, beyond individuality. He can aspire for, he sees that possibility, he can aspire for that. Can I play the music? Yes, we'll listen to Mother. Hmm? The mass immaculate grinder could outland a travail in the occult room of life. His dreamed magnificence of things to be a crown of the architecture of the world, a mystery of married earth and heaven, a seer was born, a shining gift of time. For him, mind's limiting firmament sees above. The landmark of the little person's face, 